Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, really excited to be here today. Uh, it's looking to be a, a great day. Um, I'm not going to do a deeply technical talk. I thought it would be a bit too early in the day for that. Um, it will have a technical slant to it. Um, and what I really want to try and dig into today is some ideas about the, the, the foundations that we should be laying down around how we publish data to the web and how we can enable um, digital cities. I've done quite a lot of work over the past few years of exploring different approaches to publishing data to the web, building APIs, supporting developers in trying to make the best use of that. So I've tried to distill some of that down um, and just to share some ideas. But I want to start off by um, giving you all a history lesson. Um, <clears throat> this is a portrait of Robert Hooke. Um, if you don't know Robert Hooke, he's, uh, he's actually a very famous scientist. He was an early member of the Royal Society. Um, he was described as England's Leonardo. He was uh, a, a natural philosopher, he was an inventor, uh, he was a, a surveyor and an architect. Um, I like, he's kind of a bit of a hero of mine because he's got that uh, hacker ethic that I subscribe to. He liked to cut things up, measure them, invent things, put things together and just see how the world worked. Um, he was an arch rival to Isaac Newton. Newton was more of a theorist. Hooke was more of a hacker. Um, one of the things that Hooke was um, uh, best known for, was close involved with, was the rebuilding of London after the Great Fire. So this is a map of London um, from around the time that Hooke, uh, around the time Hooke was born, I think. Um, it's called the Civitas Londinium. Uh, I wanted to show it because it, it because as a good uh, good representation of how London had grown in that time. It grown quite organically, quite haphazardly. You can see there's a, a tangle of tiny streets and houses. Much of those got raised to the ground during the Great Fire. So following the fire, um, it was seen uh, at, uh, to be an opportunity to rethink London, rethink London as a space, um, and to undertake a, a large-scale uh, rebuilding project. London hadn't been a, a fun place to live at that time. The, the, the fire um, followed closely on the heels of the Great Plague, so not really fun times for any of the citizens. So <clears throat> there was lots of encouragement um, for people to rethink what, what London would, could look like and how it could be rebuilt, and particularly from um, the monarch at the time, which is Charles, who was Charles II. So Hooke and people like Christopher Wren got together and put together a vision for how London might look. Um, this is a reconstruction of the plans that Wren presented to Charles II of, of the new London. So uh, the vision was of a big architectural project. As you can see from the plans, London would have looked very different indeed. Nice regular streets, wide boulevards, plenty of open spaces. Um, if, it had, if the plans had gone ahead, then London probably would have looked much more like Paris is today. Um, while there was a lot of support and enthusiasm for these plans, and this, this big vision for how, how the city was going to get reinvented, there was a few problems, namely nobody had the money to support it. If, the, if the London was going to be rebuilt to these kind of plans, then it would involve a lot of money. It would have involved um, compensating an awful lot of people whose houses wouldn't have got rebuilt, uh, whose uh, premises and organisations would have had to relocate. Um, the city clearly didn't have the money to support this. It was still dealing with the aftermaths of both the fire and the plague. Charles II didn't have the money either. He wasn't one of our most popular monarchs, um, and he was in the process of just going to war with the Dutch for the second time, so his taxes were being spent elsewhere. So <clears throat> what happened was something much more pragmatic, uh, much more iterative. Um, Charles II uh, called a halt to the rebuilding project and um, uh, just laid down some legislation um, to define how London was going to be rebuilt. So rather than embrace that kind of big vision, big bold vision of the future, they did something much more iterative. And what the, what the legislation uh, laid down, this was uh, an act for rebuilding the city of London, um, were some standards, for some standards for how the, the city was going to be rebuilt. 
So the Act mandated the size, width of a street, important acting as fire breaks, mandated that houses had to be rebuilt with brick instead of wood, and uh, laid down all of the uh, guidelines for things like party walls and how the, how the construction had to actually take place. It also empowered Hook and others to go out and work with the local community to uh, rebuild the city to these, to these standards. So Hook went out and he was involved in, over the course of um, six years, um, surveying something like a third of London single-handedly. So going out and measuring the space and showing that people understood which bits were theirs um, and that they were conforming to, uh, to, the, to the new act. Um, and there was, you can't see it here, but there was lots of provision in there for all the bad things that would happen to you if you didn't follow the standards. So some time has passed. I gather that the rebuilding of London is complete and has been reasonably successful. Um, so we're at a time now where we're actually starting to think again about uh, how our cities are going to be uh, reinvented for the future, ways that, that that's going to happen. To stretch a metaphor, perhaps beyond breaking point, the fire that's raging through uh, political circles at the moment is excitement about data and how that's going to allow us to innovate and do new things. And under the you know, banner of open data, we are rethinking business models, we're rethinking organisational structures, um, and are ready to kind of tear everything down and rebuild uh, with some bold vision of the future. So and the truth is, where we are today, um, we've almost got a kind of an embarrassment of riches when it comes to data access, certainly from where we were just a few short years ago. There's lots of data available. There's clearly lots more that could still, um, could still be opened up and should be opened up. But as a developer now, there's lots of data you can get your hands on. And with the commitments from um, government at all levels to start to open up more data, and there's good signs that, that that trend is now continuing. So it's a good time to think about, are we approaching this the right way? Um, how can we make sure that what we do is sustainable and really um, lets us build for the future? Part of this vision is the, is the, uh, the, the smart city uh, agenda, um, a view of uh, how we create digital cities, the spaces that we're going to be living in for the future. There's lots of different elements to that vision. Uh, some of it is about uh, sponsoring and encouraging local talent to create, literally, smarter, smarter citizenry. Um, it, a lot of it is about big investments in infrastructure, um, more uh, better access to broadband, ubiquitous wireless, sensor networks to um, let us rewire the cities in different ways. And a lot of it is also about trying to reinvent the local services. Um, to make them more timely, to make them uh, more efficient and more relevant, and targeted to us as individuals. Um, to me, data underpins all of that. It's, it's the kind of the, the real kind of cornerstones that, that underpin all of that, that vision. So I think it's right to think about how we um, how we're publishing data and how we can share it. Uh, and I think it's important to think about um, doing that in a in an iterative way. Um, so what we have done so far is created lots of data portals, or what people are now starting to call data hubs. So we have DataGov UK, um, we have the London Data Store, and there are uh, data stores in lots of cities, um, both in the UK and, and globally. The problem I have with data, these kind of data hubs as they've been built so far is that they support one particular way to publish data and really support one particular user community who, who will be consuming that data. So it's about governments uh, publishing their data and, and sharing, uh, publishing data to a single community, which is a community of developers. Um, and I think these data hubs need to evolve. I think they should be more of a multi-tenant environment. I'd like to see more people from the community, more of the local organisations, start to share their data and their information through this kind of infrastructure. And I'd like to see how um, uh, a wider, broader community can start to um, engage with the data that's being, um, uh, being surfaced in these data hubs. And, and it not just be about publishing, about here's the data, here's the finished article, now build with it. Perhaps there can be um, more uh, 
more participative ways that people can actually collaborate around the data collection itself and the, the, the management and the maintenance of the data. So it becomes more of a uh, shared resource. So we should, I think we ought to be thinking more about the kind of communities that we're expecting to be consuming the data and how we can support them. Data hubs do, a, I think, a, a good job at the moment of um, dealing with uh, demand aggregation um, because they're a good place for developers to go to and say, we need this data. Um, if you give us this, then we could, you know, we could do something interesting with it. But we also need these data hubs to be um, places for idea aggregation as well. And those ideas don't just have to come from the developer community. It should come from the, you know, the everybody uh, in, in, the, in the local space. I mean, it seems to me that uh, civic authorities are, have got lots of, of great experience in uh, managing and defining the spaces within which we live. And that space has really started to evolve now. So it's not just about the physical environment, it's about the digital environment as well. And I think if we can make data hubs into a more um, engaging place for a broader community, that's, I think, a natural evolution of the role that um, the authorities have been playing. <clears throat> so there's lots, also lots of vision about how data should be, um, should be opened up and how it should be brought into the web. Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the, the, the web, has his particular vision for how the web should evolve. So, turning it into a, a web of data. So we've started to weave together um, information in increasingly fine-grained ways into the, the web itself. This has been codified into what's often referred to as the, the five-star um, five schema for, uh, for publishing data. So you get a star for just putting your data on the web uh, at all, even if it was just in a PDF. You can get to three stars if you can put up um, a CSV file or an XML document or something that's not proprietary and is easier for people to develop as people to engage with. You get the full five stars if you fully embrace um, Tim Berners-Lee's vision of the web of data and you use some of the standard technologies from the W3C like um, RDF. I'm not going to go into all of that today, you'll be glad to know. But there's, a, there's an essence there that I think is really important to tease out. There's lots of debate and discussion still around whether this, these are the right technologies for publishing data, and I think it's reasonable to continue to have those discussions. But there's a core aspect of this vision which I think is uncontroversial, and I think is a good basis on which to build. And that's about opening up um, identifiers. So a key aspect of the uh, linked data approach is about um, giving identifiers to everything, to everything in the world, everything in the digital space as well. So having unique identifiers for places and buses and bus routes and um, trains and organisations, everything that we collect data about, everything that we want to describe should have an identifier. And in actual fact they do. The problem is, is that those identifiers are locked up in proprietary systems, they're locked up in proprietary data, uh, databases, or they're behind paywalls. And it becomes difficult um, to reuse those identifiers, it becomes difficult to use them to start to combine data from different sources because of those barriers. And really a lot of the, um, the, the push behind open data has been to create open identifiers. That's the real core um, of any data set. I don't know any developer that wouldn't immediately start to look for um, identifiers within a data set and start to think about how those could be correlated with um, other sources. So even if you don't uh, subscribe to the particular set of technologies that um, Berners-Lee is advocating, all, uh, all technologies, I think, are on board with this notion of sharing identifiers. What we do with, link, with the linked data approach is we don't just create short codes we actually create URLs for everything. So it's a URL for every bus route, it's a URL for every uh, bus stop, a URL for every service. And the reason we're doing that is that we can start to knit the data very tightly into the web infrastructure. Um, and there's lots of benefits for doing that because we can start to link together data from different sources in a much easier fashion. The way that we build context on the web is through linking. We link together documents to give you further reading, to cite sources, to give further background. We can do exactly the same with data, using exactly the same technologies. So we can qualify um, statistics, 
to indicate how the stats were collected, how they've been analysed. So if you need uh, additional uh, reference material, you can find it. We can, if we're given a URL, um, we can use any number of uh, services to start to discuss that thing. Um, we can use services like Discus to uh, host discussions around URLs. We can like things in Facebook. All of that is based. All of that, all those services are based on web infrastructure. So by integrating um, data into the web, we can reuse all of that existing work. We can reuse all of those kind of social tools that we've, that we've been using for, for documents and for content, but on data as well. But I think we can also go a little bit further because we can start to um, more collaboratively share and maintain data um, by starting to contextualize it. Um, and a lot of what I think what we'll be doing with um, the kind of open data cities movement is contextualizing data um, from central government and from local government um, based on the needs and uh, requirements and the interests of the local community. Because that's, that's the really interesting thing, where the data becomes useful when it's contextualised based on, on how you want to use it and how you want to process it. So I think one of the things we ought to be doing is encouraging di digital graffiti. You know, if the, if the local governments start to make sure that there are unique identifiers for all of their services and all of the things in the environment that they're managing, um, for that community, then the community can come along and start to annotate it. They can enrich it, they can add their useful context. And instead of just publishing data, what we can move towards is laying out infrastructure, doing the kind of surveying that Hook did in London to, to understand the space. But that, that, the fundamental part of that surveying is, is freeing up these identifiers and creating points of attachment, URLs, around which we can start to add more data and more context. So that's pretty much all I have to say. Um, so I just really want to get you thinking about data not just as data sets of something that we put up on a website, but data itself as a useful piece of infrastructure that we can start to build on. Um, and that that's, I think, offering that kind of infrastructure is as a natural evolution of the kind of role that lo uh, local authorities have been playing. Been paying because it's <clears throat> defining the boundaries of a space at which lots of different communities, perhaps with different, uh, different and divergent interests, those communities can come together and start to, to build within that space, whether it's a physical space or whether it's a digital space. Um, my colleagues have put together a demo around some of these ideas, which you can come and see in the founders' room uh, later. But um, thank you for listening.